in this uh, the presentation, which I'd just like to do for 20 minutes, and I hope we can have more questions, answers, cri criticisms, whatever you want to talk about in this, is I have a firm belief that the next 10 to 15 years for our, our species, as Lord Waldegrave uh, talked about it, I think will be the most intense that we've seen in 150 years. I think it's going to be a time of extraordinary change. Very many opportunities, but also a huge number of challenges. And I have to say at the outset that I'm, I'm actually jealous of all of you guys because you are going to be leading in the world in one of the most vital times in our, in our history. And so I think gathering groups like this together and what you're doing to think about how we can all play a role in ensuring that the, the planet is sustainable, that we can invent and, and, and also take three billion people uh, to a totally different level of standard of living and so forth, I think is, is important for all of us to do. So, so with that, what, what I wanted to do is talk a little bit about uh, why I think there are going to be some you know, tremendous amount of changes over the next 10 to 15 years in particular. And there's five forces that I just want to talk about. And these to me are like gravity. They're not related to, they're, they're not related to what a particular individual wants to do or not or how even a government works. They're like gravity. That's at least my assertion. And the first is what I just call the great rebalancing. And this is what I would really uh, emphasize is the re-rise of Asia. You know, if you look at the world GDP, and I'll show you a chart on that, over the last 2,000 years for about 1,500 of those 2,000 years, China and India represented about 60% of the world's GDP. So in a sense, we're going back to history. Um, and that's because of the size of the population, the age of the population, and the most important thing is urbanization. So I'll, I'll, I'll throw a few uh, charts on that just to illustrate it, but this is a massive change that is going on and will unfurl uh, over the next uh, 20 to, to, to 30 years. The second is a, the productivity imperative. This is shorthand for aging populations around the world, demographics, which again, you can't really change. Uh, that's, it's, it's, it's built into the system and we can actually see quite far out. And what you see there is uh, quite some challenges, particularly in the developed world, but also in some of the developing world. China's gonna have an aging problem in about 2020. Um, the third area is what we call the, gro the global grid. This is really technological innovation. And one of the things that I, I try and do, I try and visit with two CEOs or, or government leaders a day, just as a discipline to stay externally focused. I, because I joined the firm I'm in, like many other people do, because I like doing the work we do, not because I wanted to administer things internally. So I try and spend time out there. And so you get a bit of pattern recognition from that. And one of the most powerful forces that CEOs feel out there is this dramatic change in technology. The, the sort of phrase that's often used is, technology is moving three times faster than management. And I'm not talking about IT-related technology, I'm talking about biotechnology, nanotech, there's so many different areas in this front. It's just changing very quickly, dramatically, and it's distorting industries, assumptions you have about how you're business will work or even how governments work are being changed a lot by technology. The fourth force we've called pricing the planet. And this is another way, I would argue, of talking about sustainability, which is a major issue. We are, I'm very much where John McCall McBain is, I think we are in serious danger of melting this planet if we're not careful. And the forces at work, when we have, I'll show you some numbers, 900 million new people entering the middle class in the world over the next 10 years, they all want to buy cell phones and scooters and fridges and so forth, which take resources. And if they are going to consume at the same level that we consume, we say, Houston, we've got a problem coming, and, we're, and you are going to have deal with it much more than I will have to deal with that. So, but we need to do something about it now. So that's the pricing of the planet side. And the fifth one is what I would call the market state. And that is the role of government. We think that even though in McKinsey we're very much capitalists, if you will, or focusing on the markets, we think the government has an important role to play and the government's gonna play an even more important role as we go over time. And the reason for that is 
in globalization, a lot of people are being displaced. We're seeing it happen right now with the unemployment uh, rates that are going on. But we would argue a lot of the risk of the changes in the world are now going down to individuals. It's easy for someone like me to talk about the benefits of globalization, but for some people in the Midwest of the US who have a university education and their job is being now taken over by someone in India or even Morocco or Mexico, it's a slightly different situation. And that's a problem for all of us to deal with, not, not, not just to assume it will all get fixed. And governments are the ones that are left holding the bag. And the ability for governments to be able to deal with that, I think, has to improve. But that's something we all need to do. And so the role of government, I think, is another one. So those are the five forces we see out there. We think they are like gravity and they're going to they're going to create all five of them themselves a huge amount of turbulence as we go through it. So I just want to then illustrate those five uh, forces. I always like to start with a, a bit of a photo. This is a photo I took in 1997 in Shanghai of Pudong, uh, which is the new part of Shanghai. And for those uh, American friends that many people call it uh, not New Jersey, but Poo Jersey. That's the sort of nickname for this place. And that's what, that's what sort of Poo Jersey and Shanghai looked like in 1997. That's what it looked like in 2004. So you just get this dramatic shift. And this is the scale and speed of change that's going on around the world. And I think many of us that are living in the West don't realize it. We get the fact that China's growing and India's growing and Africa, by the way, which I'm a huge fan of, Africa is on the move. You, you are seeing, you are just seeing this happening in city after city. Another place I like to, I didn't take this photo. This was done in 1987 in Shenzhen. This is where uh, Deng Xiaoping made the famous statement among many, which is, I don't care if the cat is black or white as long as it catches a mouse. In other words, I don't care if it's a communist cat or a capitalist cat. If it catches a mouse, we like it. That's what, what downtown Shenzhen looked like in 1987. That's what Shenzhen looks like in, in 2004. So again, just the speed and scope of urbanization is there. I talked in the overview uh, comments just about the re-rise of, of Asia. I just call this the Marco Polo chart, uh, which it's actually done uh, by Angus Madison. I mean, we, didn't, uh, we didn't do this work. But I think it's very illustrative of some of the changes that are going on uh, in the world. And so one of the things I would say and we say this to people that are joining our firm, and I think it's for any firm that's out there, if you don't have an experience of working with someone from India or China or Indonesia within a five-year period, you are missing out big time in terms of where the world's moving, where the world's going. It doesn't mean you have to live in Beijing, Shanghai, Delhi, Jakarta, and so forth, or, or for that matter, many cities in Brazil, but you better have some experiences and interactions with, with people from those countries on, on, a, on a professional uh, manner. Um, this urbanization, uh, wh which we think is one of the biggest drivers of the rebalancing, is something that governments find very difficult to stop. Even in China, I lived in, in Shanghai for about six years, and I remember the efforts that the mayor of Shanghai took to try and prevent people from moving from the rural areas to the cities. There are all sorts of uh, permits that one has to get if you're a migrant worker, you, your children can't be educated or they certainly won't be subsidized, they have to, be, all sorts of issues, you can't stop it. It just keeps moving. And basically in the world today, we're seeing 1.3 million people moving from rural areas to cities every week. Again, like clockwork, you just can't stop it. Vietnam, I, we could go, I could rattle off the different uh, places in the world. And that's a big factor. It's going to have a huge impact on the environment, but also on things like infrastructure uh, and consumption. If you look at actually consumption in the world, this is where I came to this point about the 900 million consumers, and if there's only one thing I hope you'd remember from the presentation is, just think again, 900 million new middle class consumers in the next 10 years, we've never seen that in our history as humans. It's never happened. And the challenge is it's happening very, very quickly. It's not going to happen over a 50-year period. It's happening in 10 years. Uh, and you see that that is obviously affecting a lot of corporations, but it's also affecting a lot of governments. I mean, one 
story I like to tell to illustrate this from a government point of view. I met the new minister of foreign affairs in Chile, just when the Chilean new government was coming in, just about a week after the earthquake last year. And we were sitting with him in a conference room and he said to me, you know, we would like to have some of your advice from McKinsey on how we should think about our diplomacy. And I said, I think you've made a big mistake because we, we are the opposite of diplomats and um, we will screw up whatever you do on that front. We're not the people to talk to. And he said, no, you don't, you don't understand what I'm saying. His aide de camp was the am ambassador to Austria for Chile. And he said, no, my question is the following. He said, in Chile, all of our diplomatic efforts or the weight of our diplomats are really to other parts of South America and Europe. That's where we have it. And he says, I have to ask myself the question, with all respect to my Austrian uh, friend here, or who's ser you know, serving in the embassy in Austria, why do we have diplomatic resources weighted towards Europe and we have none in the emerging markets of Asia? Why do we not have an ambassador to Tamasic, which is the sovereign wealth fund in Singapore, or the CIC, which is the largest uh, fund in the world, which is run out of Beijing? Why do we not have an ambassador to the Honda Motor Company? Just some very different creative thinking in terms of how things are moving, but obviously trying to pivot Chile into a different part of the world and where they're going. And so again, even governments, which as Nari would say, may not be moving as fast as what the corporates are doing, are having to reposition and rethink themselves and where they're, uh, where they're positioned. Um, the consumption side, I think, goes without saying. The only part, again, I would say here is it's the absolute numbers. It's not about percentages. It's the absolute numbers uh, are significant. Uh, and that's something that if you, are a, if you are a global consumer goods company now and you do not have more than 30% or if you, if you have less than 30% of your revenues coming from China, this part of the world, there's a danger you're going to become irrelevant uh, over time. And so the push on talent, the push on being able to build and develop uh, businesses in these markets is on in a, a very a fast way. I think the other thing we should think about when we, th when we think about these new markets is this is going to be an incredible source of innovation. This is not some low-cost factory where people pump out machines for the Western world to be able to consume. There's an incredible amount of innovation that's going on, and I would argue that we are going to see a rebalancing of innovation from the developed world to the emerging market world over the next 10 years. In the Nano is an example of that. It was, by the way, what I think is very interesting, it was developed by three engineers. The average age, in fact, none of them was over 31 years of age. The average age was 27 years old. And they'd only had experience in building one car. So if you went to BMW uh, and Volkswagen and told them that if McKinsey went to them and said, we got a new idea for you for car design, we'd like to have a less than 30-year-old team with very little car experience design a new car, I can tell you the meeting wouldn't last very long. We'd be thrown out. But these guys built it, and it was innovation for a price point. It had to be done for $2,500. And it's not to say it was a smooth process. It's not to say that there aren't bumps uh, in the road, so to speak. But the fact is that they got innovation through, um, through challenging orthodoxies and what they did. Uh, infrastructure, I mentioned, is going to be a huge area of, of opportunity and challenge. We think it's roughly a $10 trillion market. There's not very many markets that are like that. Here there's a huge issue between private sector and public sector being able to work together. And I'll give you an example of India and, and uh, Indonesia. Both of these countries need massive amounts of infrastructure, power plants, railways, roads, and so forth. And what you have is a situation where the country needs it for economic development. It's a no-brainer. You don't need people like us to come in and say it makes sense to do that. You have pension funds around the world, including in Canada, that want to invest seriously in these projects because it matches with their uh, portfolio, if you know what I mean, in terms of, of, of people that will be retiring for the long term. But the market completely fails. It doesn't work. It doesn't, and this is where you need private public sector cooperation to figure it out. It's one of these unsolved problems. I love the, 
the comment you were making, I can't remember the name, of the, the, on, on defining math, the, the agenda for mathematics. One of the things I would say with all of these five forces, I think there are actually hundreds of these big unresolved issues and they're worth billions and trillions of dollars in terms of what we do. And so in infrastructure, again, huge need on both the, the, the consumption side, but also the investment side, but the market is not working. And I could say this, I could go through many examples in Africa uh, of that as well. Some places are doing it quite effectively. You can argue with some of the other issues that go with it. I mean, China is quite unbelievable with the amount of infrastructure that they're, they're putting in place and how fast uh, that they do it. And if you think that they've spent a lot on infrastructure already, you actually haven't seen anything yet because they've got more coming. Uh, and it's again in railroads, airports, highways, ports, and so forth. And again, this has significant uh, environmental challenges, both in terms of the resources required and also just the uh, construction that's there. I mentioned Africa. Uh, Africa has seen, I'm just, you know, I was actually born in Uganda, so I consider myself an African first. Um, and, but Africa's always been seen as the, as the lost continent. Who knows what's going to happen? It's always the continent on the come, lots of changes, volatility, and so forth that you all know. We actually think that over the last seven years, there have been some very important changes that we think will make Africa an extraordinarily important market for investors, for corporations, and so forth. And this is not driven by the resource demands. You can talk about Chinese companies and other Asian countries going into Africa for resources. That is not at all what's driving it. It's actually the consumer. And if you look, it's actually telecom companies in particular which have driven a huge amount of change. There were five million Africans that had mobile phones in 2000. There are about, I think now, 400 million. It's a huge shift. You're going to hear from Mo Ibrahim, I think, tonight, who is one of the greatest innovators that we have. But I cannot tell you enough what that has done to consumption, but also, frankly, stability. This period in time, if you look at any measure of conflicts and wars and so forth, is at an order of magnitude less volatile. And that's allowed people uh, to be able to have the stability to make the investments and drive things forward. Lots of other, this, we could be a whole talk in itself that many others would be more qualified. All I would say is let's not, do not certainly, you better not forget Africa and you better focus on Africa as you look ahead. And by the way, the people who are learning about Africa first seem to be the emerging markets, not the West. It was in a sense China that has rediscovered Africa, uh, not the West. And we're seeing it with South, South America. The first CEO conference that I ever went to was actually in Nigeria. It was a China uh, Africa CEO conference. And in fact, when I showed up, the organizers looked a little concerned. They weren't as polite as you guys. And they said, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm, you invited me to come and speak. And they said, but yeah, but you're not Chinese. I said, yeah, I, I kind of get that. And they said, yeah, but we, you said you lived in Shanghai and McKinsey had a Chinese guy. And I said, well, I'm so, I was the only uh, Caucasian uh, in the group. And it was a, I found it very interesting because A, it was Chinese executives with African executives and government leaders trying to forge relationships and do things together. And I felt like an outsider. And I think that that's what the world can become unless we're actually going to be involved in that because it's happening uh, anyhow. Many of the old trade routes that existed and were strong a thousand uh, years ago and before are going to be the strongest trading routes as we go forward. One of my favorite places to travel is actually on the old Silk Road. And that is the fastest growing trade route on earth today. A thousand years ago, it was the biggest trade route that we had. And this isn't just oil going from the Middle East, from Saudi Arabia into China. It's a lot of capital goods, it's a lot of services, and it's a lot of investment. And it's growing quickly. And just to give you a sense of the speed of change, I was in uh, Abu Dhabi about five years ago, and it was a China Middle East conference. We were hosting it with the Financial Times. There were seven qualified translators in Arabic and Mandarin for business, seven. It, you think about it for what was going on. And what's happened is you now have five universities in China with the support of particularly Saudi Arabia, which are churning out 2,500 
translators per year to be able to meet the demands of what's going on here again uh, that's there. But that's, these old trade routes are going to be coming back, so I think it's worth spending time looking at it. It's also worth, if you can, to have a chance to travel on them. Uh, trade routes, as I mentioned, in the changing. A lot of people think Asia is about producing goods that then get shipped outside. It's sort of the trade is from Asia to the rest of the world. Many people don't realize that the vast bulk of Asian trade is within Asia trade. We're seeing Asia becoming much more of a region than it ever had before. And that's something, too, to be thinking about in terms of changes that are going on. Obviously, with all of these changes, the 900 million consumers, the urbanization, we're seeing more of the most significant companies in the world coming from this part uh, of the world, and it's growing very quickly. You just, we, we don't recognize many of the names that we're seeing, and they're going to be very significant uh, for all of us to be able to, uh, to deal with. So I hope that just gives you, I spent longer on this one than I will on the others. I just want to give you a sense of uh, this major force, which is a rebalancing in world economic power, which is going to happen whether you like it or not. It's, and, and what I would say is many of our clients, if I talk to some of the oil companies and the commodity providers, they believe it'll happen faster than we are predicting uh, it, it happen. Aging population, just a couple of quick charts on this. Uh, this is basically looking at the world from 2001 to 2050 in probably an over, overly simplistic way. But just saying, you know, in 2001, we basically had 10 working adults for every uh, retiree, and that's going to shift down to three per one. That's a big, big problem from a GDP growth point of view, because GD in GDP growth, it's driven fundamentally by two factors. One is the productivity growth of the workers that you have, but the primary driver is actually the number of workers that you have. Many people don't realize in the U.S., 70% of the GDP growth over the last 30 years came from new workers coming into the workforce, primarily women, but also immigration. When you look at the U.S. workforce going ahead, the aging population, it's going to flip. We're only going to get 30% coming from uh, the workforce unless we do something unbelievably different on the immigration side. 70% will have to come from productivity, which is why we need technology and shifts. Europe is even worse. Now, I was, I was in Morocco yesterday. We're doing some work to help Morocco become more of a, uh, if you will, a factory outsourcing center manufacturing hub for Europe. And it's in Europe's interest that Morocco is successful because there aren't going to be the workers to be able to produce the goods that are required. And that's a, a bit of an emotional change for some leaders uh, in Europe to deal with, but they, I'm telling you they're going to have to deal with it, uh, whether they like it or not. Um, I'm going to skip uh, ahead just for the sake of time. On the uh, repricing of the planet the, the, and, and the sustainability issue, as I mentioned, with the 900 million consumers, a lot of people uh, are going to be demanding more resources. We think we're in a long-term commodities boom. Whether the oil price dropped $6 yesterday or goes up, c copper, oil, rare minerals, they are on an upswing. And coming from Canada, that's what, you know, when you see the, the, the battle that BHP had, which effectively began with the Canadian government on Potash Corporation, you know, the, to provide the fertilizer and so forth that's moving forward. This is why you see countries like Korea buying large tracts of land in Africa for agri-food, and I'm going to come back to that. This is something that we're all going to have to grapple with. How do we use our resources much, much more efficiently. It's one of the biggest unresolved problems that we have out there in how, how we do it, because we simply cannot consume in the way that we are today. It's just, it's just not going to work. And just to give you a couple of illustrations of that water, this is an area that we are very focused on in McKinsey. This is an area where we, in work with six of our clients in the IFC, we tried to estimate the demand supply balance in water for the next uh, 20 years. And what we found by looking at literally hundreds of basins is if we consume in the way we are and we do not use the technology that we actually have today, there will be a 40% over demand versus supply on water. And that's not something that you want to have, not only for our physical good, but because typically this creates wars. 
And interestingly enough, one of the biggest sources and uses of water are from the Himalayas, as you know, in terms of what that does. And if you think about China, India, Vietnam relationships, I think a lot of it is going to depend on what we do with water uh, over time. So this is something that we have to deal with. The problem is water doesn't listen to politics. Water flows where it wants to go. Um, and it, it, it's moved by uh, construction companies and what they do. And if we don't think about it more holistically in where things are, we are going to head into a big problem. Energy, I think there's more qualified speakers talking about this later on. I just say here, the demand for energy is just on a very, very significant rise and will continue to do so. That's why I find it very interesting if you look at the, at the 12th five-year plan that China has just put out. I was in Beijing. They, Beijing asks people from outside to criticize their plan. It's the most amazing thing. I wish other countries, I wish Canada did that, where they actually ask people to come in and challenge. And if you go in and say nice things like, isn't it amazing how fast China's growing and blah, 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 they're not interested in that. It's what's the focus and you're given an area to look at. If you look at their five-year plan, this is a, it's, it's one of the most memorable ones. The, the fifth and the ninth year were, were some of the most significant in the last time. The fifth was when Deng Xiaoping opened up, and the ninth is when they privatized a lot of the state-owned enterprises, including banks. This one is very much focused on environmental issues, interestingly enough. So they don't just talk about GDP growth, which they're now saying is about 7%. They spent a lot of the time talking about the efficiency of GDP growth, the water per GDP point, the energy usage per GDP point. Very specific, more detailed than I've ever seen any corporation do. Uh, but, folk, but they know they have to deal with that or they're going to have major problems. And then food, um, we're going to have a, a, a major food problem over time. This, now I'm not talking about 900 million people, I'm talking about 3 billion more people on the planet and you think about what we're gonna to need to do to feed that group, and with a group that wants to move from grains to meat and so forth, you can see the, the consequences of that. So big challenges on that front. On the, on the global grid or technology, just a few points I just wanna make here. One is that today there are five billion people with mobile phones, which is quite an extraordinary accomplishment for the human race. I might add that McKinsey and Company, we did a work with a, with a telecom company in 1990, we predicted that the future demand for cell phones, we often get criticized, so I might as well make it out there, would be a maximum of 90,000. We just no, couldn't be beyond that. So it's nice to see that number uh, all the time. So, we, so five billion that are out there. And obviously people, those people aren't talking to each other, but, you think, but many of them are. And you think about the connectedness and the platforms that that creates for change, which were seeing in, in North Africa in particular, but also from how you run your organization if you're a company, how you communicate what's inside a company, what's outside a company. This has huge implications. Um, the, I won't go into the Facebook being the world's third largest country, though again, when you look at what's happened in North Africa, it's quite relevant. Um, and I think when you think about international relations and governance, a lot of thinking has to be applied here because we, it's an unresolved area. What does it mean to be a citizen? Uh, who are you a citizen of? What country, what group? But the thing that I find um, most interesting is the speed and volume with which information can move. There's a, uh, if, if, there's a router that's used in today, and I'll just give you a comparison, to be able to move information, as you know, from one place to another. Uh, if you decided for some bizarre reason that you wanted to download the U.S. Library of Congress, and I'm not suggesting you should or anyone smart would want to, but let's assume you wanted to, and you wanted to do that in the year 2000, and you do it on your, on, over the modem on your phone, it would take about 82 years for that information to get to your computer. Today, Cisco and others have developed the, the mechanics, the servers, the routers, and so forth, such you can do it in one second. One second, you get the U.S. Library of Congress with the machinery they have. And again, the implications of that for where you do R&D as a company and how you organize yourselves is just profound because you don't have to have it all concentrated in one area. It can be very spread. So one of the big shifts that we're seeing when people do innovation, it's much more open architecture. It's not this notion of 
you have to do it all inside. And that includes our own organization. We spend about half a billion dollars a year on knowledge because that's, that's one of our core assets. And it's a big orthodoxy for us to realize that, you know what, there's a lot of other really smart people out there that know a lot more than we do. And we have to open that up and be able to draw on that to be able to do more. And I think you're seeing more and more organizations do it. And it's facilitated by these uh, technology uh, changes. And if you look at areas or sectors which are really behind on the technology front, they're actually in some of the areas where we need to see the most advances. And, and forgive me for using a phrase like this, but in healthcare is one of the most technologically retarded industries I've seen in my life. It is completely backward. It doesn't have any of the sharing of information on people's, even for yourself amongst institutions about how you're doing, let alone applying any of that to devices and so forth. And this is just a chart to, to illustrate it. Huge disruptions and opportunities to be created there. And then in education, which is going to be absolutely vital to, to the future for, for all of us, the, the technology penetration of that sector is very low. Many of the innovations, as I mentioned, are occurring in the emerging markets. I just, here's the GE's electrocardiograph, that typically being done in, I think it's Schenectady. Uh, now it's being done uh, in Bangalore, and it's done at 15% of the price point that's done in the US, and that's because they had to, because you can't charge people what they charge in the US for it, so it forced them to innovate, and that's what they're doing, and that's why you're seeing a lot more of GE's and Siemens and Novartis's R&D being done uh, in that part of the world. The final area is just on the state, the market state, as I mentioned. Just a few points I wanted to make here. I think that this is going to be one of the most challenged areas uh, on the planet, and we need to not blame government, but work with government, because if government doesn't get it right, we are all going to have a lot of problems. And that's not to say that government are stupid or government doesn't get it or where they're moving. There are a huge set of issues that cannot be dealt with on a purely rational basis. And I think we all need to, to understand that. One of the biggest concerns we have is with this aging population that's going on. And do you know that it can be, you just asked Professor John Bell what the exact numbers are, but 80% of medical costs are typically consumed in the last couple of years of a person's life. You know, it, it, there's, there's a curve uh, that moves like that. And you, you saw those demographic charts that I showed you before, which is we're going to have a very aged population. The demand on medical care is going to go through the roof. It's, it's actually one of the fastest growing global industries in the world. And if it, if it grows in the way it does, it's going to bankrupt all of us. And so we're going to have to figure out how to make that work. I actually believe it shouldn't be seen that way. Medical services should be seen as a consumer good. Why, why should it be seen as a cost? But the way it's configured, as Lord Waldegray said, the governance of it is such that it's, it could be an anchor chain uh, on us. This is why, for example, I think you're going to see more regulation in the food industry. It's not going to be long before many governments are going to go to food companies and say, you know what? cut the amount of sugar, cut the amount of sodium, because we are going to pay for it. So you can't do that. And that is panicking some of the food companies that are out there. But this is the point about what I would, in, this, in a long-term capitalism, which is something that I very much believe in, people have to look at stakeholders versus shareholders. You better think about the consequences of the products that you produce, because someone's going to pay for it. And if you don't think about that, someone's going to sort it out. And my view is it'll be government. So that, that, there's a big set of demographic-related issues that are out there. This growing income inequality is something that I personally worry about the most. I think that's one of the biggest drivers of revolution and, and instability. That's something that keeps the Chinese leadership awake at night more than anything else, is seeing that surge. I've talked before, where I lived in Shanghai, uh, was in a, in a place called Xintiandi, which is right in the downtown area. Five minutes to my left by walk, there was a Rolls-Royce dealership, literally these huge Rolls-Royces gleaming I could, that were out there. Five minutes to the right were 500 migrant workers living in, at best, what could be called mobile homes. And I remember talking to my colleagues and saying, how can these things coexist with each other? Because those migrant workers walk by the Rolls-Royce dealership every morning. Um, and the view was, as long as 
the tide rises for everyone, it's okay. But if the tide stops, there's going to be one hell of a problem that's going to occur. And I think we're seeing income inequality is rising everywhere on earth, which is a big problem for all of us. The only place, interestingly, where it's not is Brazil. Uh, Brazil, it's actually been decreasing. Uh, so that's, th these are some things that I think we're going to need to think about. And as a result, I think all of us, public sector, academics, private sector, are going to have to think hard about what we're doing on education, what we're doing in healthcare, financial systems, and also in commodities. These are common issues, they're public good uh, issues. If we were to think then about the big businesses of tomorrow, I think they're the following. I think agri-food is going to be the single largest sector in the world, and it's something that I think where a lot of innovation is required. Healthcare, long-term care, clean tech, water uh, is, is going to be something extremely important. Education uh, and technology enablement. That's just one person's view. I'm sure you have uh, other uh, views that are out there. For the sake of time, I'm just going to uh, skip to the, to the end, which really is... I think some of the challenges that we just need to be thinking about. One is I would say that given those forces of work that are going on, all of us are going to have to challenge some of the orthodoxies of what we believe we've been working in as we go forward because they will be disrupted. Uh, so that's something for all of us to think through. Everyone is considering doing some sort of technology experiments or pilots. You have to. If you don't in a way cannibalize yourself, you'll be cannibalized by someone else. And so the notion of having a wide range of experiments and pilots and things like that in different parts of the world is going to be extremely important. Data is going to be absolutely critical uh, in what we do, data analytics. Partnerships will be even more important, how you work with different companies and organizations. Um, and then risk management in a very different way. And I'm not talking about financial risk management. I'm talking about operational risk management and people risk management and reputation issues. And the final point I just want to make is leadership and management. And I would say that all of you here, given the, the scholarships that you've won and the fact that you are, you know, you've been selected and chosen, in my view, is because you're leaders. It's not because you're hoop jumpers. I hope you're not people that... I did six extracurricular things because that's the way I get ahead, because if that's the way you think, it's going to be a long life. I think, I think what, what we need and what we're looking for are leaders, which are people that have dreams, big, bold ideas that ask really interesting and courageous questions that don't necessarily know the answer for how they're going to get them. They're courageous in what they do. They're resilient. In other words, they can deal with failures and twists in the road because the, the, it won't be a straight line in terms of how you move. That's what's going to be important and we have a shortage of leadership. And so again, I think you all getting together to help reinforce what you do very well to deal with all these challenges is going to help all of us. So thank you very much.